except Allah the creator of all things and we bear witness that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last and the final messenger of Allah to mankind uh, I remind my brothers and sisters and myself first and foremost to have taqwa at all times and taqwa means being God conscious remembering him in such a way and to such an extent that it prevents the person from doing that which is wrong and motivates them to do that which Allah has commanded. We ask Allah to make us from al-muttaqeen. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him would remind in his uh, speech that the truthful speech, the best words, are the words of Allah, the Quran. And the best example and guidance in this religion to follow and to emulate is the guidance of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the worst of affairs in this religion are things that people have innovated and added in the beliefs and in the acts of worship because those innovations are actually forms of misguidance no matter how uh, nice they may appear on the surface and misguidance leads to the hellfire may Allah protect us from that uh, brothers and sisters I haven't been here for a long time on a Sunday usually I come on Saturdays for the new Muslim class um, but Sheikh is in Umrah mashallah I think this is uh, his fourth Umrah this year, alhamdulillah. May Allah accept and, and bless all of us to go again soon. Um, so we'll continue on. We are talking about what every Muslim must know. There were two books that I was referring to. Uh, this is the second one, Explanation of Important Lessons for Every Muslim. It was a booklet written by the late uh, scholar Ibn Baz, rahimahullah. May Allah have mercy on him. And it was expanded upon and explained by some scholars and students of knowledge and then translated into English so we were going through the pillars of faith and I believe we had already covered four of the pillars of faith in previous lessons uh, before that we had talked about Tawheed we talked about monotheism in Islam we talked about Shirk we talked about uh, the meaning and understanding of the concept of Iman and Islam and Ihsan so we've already had a number of lessons from this series although it's been some months uh, since we've been able to talk on, on this uh, topic. So we continue on today. Uh, in this white book, it's page 185. And uh, it's the fifth pillar of Iman, the fifth pillar or article of faith. And that is belief in the last day. Belief in the last day. Now the day of judgment, last day is one of the names of day of judgment. Uh, in uh, Dr. Umar Sulaiman al-Ashqar's book, which is a very uh, a good series about the pillars of Iman. So you can find uh, at least one volume on each pillar of Iman. And he goes into great detail about all the topics and subtopics around this issue. So on the Day of Judgment itself, he has several books. One book on Paradise and Hellfire, for example. One book on uh, the minor Day of Judgment and Resurrection, which would be when you die and life in the grave and so on. And then one about the uh, major day of judgment meaning the day of judgment when everyone is resurrected and so on so he goes into great detail <clears throat> when he talks about just the names of day of judgment he brings 25 different names that Allah and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used to refer to the day of judgment and the reason the scholars said there are so many names is because something as great and as important as the event and the events that will occur in the hereafter and on the day of judgment it, it deserves and needs to be described in great detail so every name is adding to the attributes and the the qualities of the day of judgment for people to understand what exactly it's all about and how significant an event it is yeah you find that Allah always mentions belief in him and the day of judgment to, together so he will say whoever believes in Allah and the last day. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uses this kind of expression all the time as well. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day, then let them do such and such. Or let them not do such and such. So these two go together. Why? Because if somebody claims that they believe in God, but then they don't believe in accountability before God, they don't believe in the day of judgment, they don't believe they will be resurrected and held to account, then that is a, is, is a dangerous combination. So despite the fact that they believe in Allah, they may do whatever they want, not concerned about the consequences because they don't believe there will be any consequences. For example, they might 
feel that something will or will not happen to them in this life, but nothing will happen in the hereafter, or they are in doubt about whether anything will happen to them in the hereafter. Yeah? So that's obviously uh, a, a dangerous mix and problematic. When we hear about how the Sahaba were so committed to Allah and to following the religion of Islam and uh, obeying the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu commands, you find that uh, um, Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu focused on the fact that the first thing that had to be developed in the Sahaba was a strong connection with Allah and the hereafter in particular. So she mentions that the first things that were revealed from the Quran to the companions of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him were not don't drink alcohol, don't commit fornication. There weren't these rules and regulations that were being revealed. The first thing that was revealed was about the greatness of Allah and his creation, about the day of judgment, about paradise and hellfire, so that people's hearts were then connected and they were very in tuned to what is the purpose of this life and the fact that they had certainty in what would happen in the hereafter based on what Allah and the Prophet ﷺ had informed them. So as a result, when commands came down later, their attitude was immediately سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We heard Allah's command, we heard the Prophet ﷺ conveying it and immediately we are ready to obey. Rather than as the attitude of some uh, Muslims might be today, they want to question and debate and they want to ask, well, uh, why? And if you explain why, they will ask why again and they want to go through so many details and it's a long process before you can convince the person that they should do this command from Allah or they should not do this thing which has been forbidden. So that should not be the attitude and that's not the attitude when a person is strongly in tune with the hereafter and the day of judgment, meaning they're conscious of the fact that they will meet Allah, whether today or tomorrow, and they know that they will be accountable for what they do. So this is a very um, uh, significant topic throughout the Quran, throughout the sayings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and it should have a very tangible effect in a believer's life. What we mentioned today, we might only superficially go through some topics. We are not going very deep. So the idea is you should refer to other uh, books. And I was told that Sheikh did go through a book, uh, Knowing the Last Day, prior to the book that he's currently covering, about knowing the books of Allah. Yeah? Uh, so here the author has mentioned, belief in the last day is the fifth pillar of Iman. And what it means is that we must believe with certainty in all that Allah informed us in his book and all that the Messenger of Allah informed us about regarding what happens after death. Yeah? So this is called the knowledge and the world of the unseen. Meaning none of us have gone there, seen it, and been able to come back and give the detailed account of what happens in the grave and what happens on the day of judgment and what will happen in paradise and hellfire. So this information was conveyed to us by Allah and by the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. When we verify the source, then we accept it with certainty. Yeah? And this is very important because when you testify that Muhammad wasallam is the messenger of Allah, that entails basic things. It entails, number one, you believe him in what he's informed. Without doubt, if it's confirmed in an authentic narration that Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, after death, such and such happens, then you accept it and you believe it, no doubt. For example, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said, people on the day of judgment who have committed certain crimes, Allah will make them walk on their face. So the Sahaba said, how could somebody walk on their face? So the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah who makes them walk the way they walk in this life will make them walk on their face. Finished. It's not difficult for Allah. Yeah? When we talk about resurrection as a concept in general, the uh, people past and present had a hard time accepting it. They said, you are telling us after people disintegrate and dissolve and become dust and their bones have crumbled, they will come back to life and they will be as they were before and Allah will hold them to account. So Allah reminds of very basic things. Number one, that mankind was created from dust. So if you believe 
as Allah informed us that he created Adam the first human being ever from dirt then it's not difficult to believe that Allah will resurrect those who have crumbled and become dust and Allah reminds of a very basic concept is it more difficult to do something from scratch the first time or is it more difficult to redo something again so for example you're building a house from nothing or the house falls apart and you rebuild it which one is more difficult it's more difficult to build it the first time from nothing so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created from nothing and brought us into existence and no one can deny that they exist although some philosophers have tried yeah you exist and there was a time when you didn't exist and Allah brought us into existence which means he's capable of doing such an amazing thing yeah He's the first with no beginning. Everything else has a beginning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who did that the first time, He's even more capable of doing it again. It's not difficult for Him. Yeah? It's not difficult for Him. <coughs> um, so when we talk about belief in the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we said you believe Him in what He's informed. Number two, you obey him in what he's commanded. So he says you should do this, you must do this. You uh, refrain from what he's prohibited and forbidden. Yeah? And you worship Allah in the way that he has taught, following his example. So to believe in Allah and to love Allah and to recognize Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a messenger automatically necessarily entails that you then worship Allah in the way that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has taught us to do meaning not by innovating or coming up with your own way and so on okay so uh, what we will mention now from the ayat and ahadith this is from the knowledge of the unseen that Allah and his messenger have conveyed to us it's an essential component of being a true believer in Allah in his messenger and in the day of judgment that you accept that information in many cases the how will be unknown so for example we say that there will be a scale and Allah will weigh things on the day of judgment he will weigh people he will weigh deeds he will so we accept that we believe that what does the scale look like how exactly does it function is there one scale or many scales some of these details we don't have so we don't ask we accept what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us and we cannot speculate beyond that because this is knowledge again of the unseen world. Uh, this includes, so belief in the day of judgment includes the following, the trial of the grave. So the Prophet sallallahu uh, when he was asked, when is the day of judgment going to be? So the group that had come to ask them, he said, when this person and there was a youngster in the group he said when this person reaches old age if Allah gives him long life then all of you your day of judgment will already have started meaning by the time he reaches old age all the men and older people that were there would have died so their judgment their hereafter world would already have begun so the reality is some of the details that people want to know when exactly is the day of judgment going to be established for example it's irrelevant the reality is it's coming when it's coming is not important so when some people would ask the Prophet Sallallahu when is the day of judgment he said what have you prepared for it that's what you should really be concerned about because the moment you die whether it's before the day of judgment or as a result of the day of judgment your accountability is going to begin and your chance to do in preparation for the day of judgment is already over so the believer should be living with this attitude that I may die any moment and I need to be ready for that accountability and that uh, recompense that is going to happen in the hereafter so that will begin with life in the grave once the person dies yeah the punishment and reward in the grave resurrection the gathering of mankind for the accountability the judgment that will actually occur once it begins the scale of deeds the hawd the hawd is the pool or the basin that Allah has blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and each prophet and messenger with that uh, their true followers and believers will be allowed to drink from yeah on the day of judgment the sirat the path 
that will go over the hellfire that everyone will have to pass over. May Allah protect us. The intercession and intercessions that will occur. Paradise and hellfire. And all that Allah has prepared in these two abodes for the dwellers. So all of these topics and subtopics, they come under the concept of belief in the last day. What are the proofs? that uh, show us that it's compulsory to believe in the last day. There are many verses in the Quran, many sayings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam. We can uh, mention some of them. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّصَارَى وَالصَّابِئِينَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Verily, those who believe and those who were Jews and Christians and Sabians, whoever believes in Allah in the last day and does righteous good deeds shall have their reward with their Lord. On them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. So an essential component, we said always, belief in Allah comes usually paired with belief in the accountability, the day of judgment, and so on. Allah says in the Quran, it is not al-birr. It is not piety and righteousness that you turn your faces towards east or west. East and west, yeah? So this is in relation to when the prayer direction, the qibla was changed. The Muslims for about 18 months, I believe, were praying towards Jerusalem. Then they were commanded by Allah to pray towards Mecca. So the people of the book said to them, mm, but then what will happen to your prayers for those 18 months? You were praying in the different direction. Now all the reward of what you had done is lost, is gone. And of course that's not the case. Uh, so Allah then clarifies what is real righteousness. It's not necessarily that you prayed in this direction or that direction. But al-bir, uh, this uh, righteousness and piety is the quality of the one who believes in Allah. The last day, the angels, the book, the prophets and gives his wealth in spite of love for it to the kinsfolk, to the orphans, and to the uh, poor, and to the wayfarer, and to those who ask, and to set slaves free. Performs prayers, and gives the zakah, and who fulfill their covenant when they make it. So Allah describes the believers in all their pillars of faith and belief that they have, and in the good actions, basically you can see there the pillars of Islam, the prayers, zakah, and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> Allah the Almighty also says regarding the resurrection, then again surely you will be resurrected on the day of resurrection. So believing that there is life after death, and Muslims of course don't believe in multiple lives after death. So in some religions they believe in reincarnation and they believe that it's an infinite loop. So you will be resurrected or you will be reincarnated into this world time and time again after you die. You come one time as a rock, one time as an animal, one time as a plant, one time as a human, or different castes and levels within the humans. So these are beliefs that are uh, uh, present in some religions. Jazakallah khairan. These are uh, beliefs that are present in some religions. So we don't uh, uh, believe that in Islam. We believe that there are only two lives. And nowadays it's a, it's a common uh, slogan even amongst the youth you only live once. Yeah? So meaning, do whatever you want, be crazy, don't worry about it, because really there are no consequences. So enjoy whatever you can, as much as you can, in this world. And we know that Allah's uh, uh, wisdom and ultimate knowledge doesn't fit with the concept of you will do whatever you want in this world and there will be no accountability for it whatsoever. This is unacceptable. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created us for a great purpose, also on the day of judgment, His mercy, His justice will prevail. So in this life we can see that good things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people. All of this will be sorted out on the day of judgment. Meaning good people who suffered will be rewarded. Those who were evil and they uh, received uh, blessings and bounties in this life, they will be accountable for that. <clears throat> so Allah says, then again, surely you will be resurrected on the day of resurrection. In the famous hadith, which we've talked about multiple times in this class, when the angel Gabriel came in the form of a man, he asked the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, what is Islam? And the Prophet wasallam mentioned the five pillars of Islam. He said, what is Iman? And the Prophet wasallam mentioned the six pillars of faith. 
and one of those pillars, one of those articles is belief in the last day. So the Prophet ﷺ said to believe in Allah, His angels, His books, His messengers, the last day, and to believe in divine preordainment, both the good and the bad of it. This was recorded by Imam Muslim. So uh, now we'll go through some of those sub points one by one. So the first one that they mention here is the punishment of the grave and its pleasures. So Muslims believe that there is a life in the grave. Yeah, Alimul Barzakh, the world of the Barzakh. And Barzakh literally means a kind of barrier that's in place between those who have died and the life of this world. So we don't believe, for example, in ghosts. Yeah, we don't believe that the spirit or soul of a person after they die can influence this world or can come and visit this world or can speak with people in this world. Any of those kind of occurrences that, uh, for example, someone says, the voice of the person sounded like my relative, the information they gave was secret between me and them, no way anybody else could know it. All of this is done through the jinn. Yeah, this is done through the world of the jinn, and this is not actually the soul of the person coming back to this life. So Allah has already mentioned in the Quran in detail how much regret a person will have when they die if they had not been striving to do good. And they would wish that they could come back to this world even for moments so that they could give charity, for example. Yeah, because they hadn't been generous enough with their wealth and they see the great reward that Allah will have in, in store for people in the hereafter as a result of charity. So they would wish that they could come back just so that they could give some more of their wealth, for example, but Allah will not allow them even for a moment to return. So once you cross over into that next world, it's a permanent uh, uh, move. Now, Somebody might say, we have people that are not buried. The Prophet ﷺ told us about a man. A man said to his family, he said, I've uh, done so much wrong, so when I die, you have to cremate me and then crush what's left of me, grind it all up, the bones, everything. And then you have to distribute it in different ways. Throw some of it in the ocean, throw some of it in the wind, bury some of it, because if Allah is going to resurrect me, he's going to punish me with a severe punishment for what I've done. So he was hoping that he can try perhaps to escape. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect him despite the fact that he was crushed into dust or distributed throughout the earth. That's not difficult for Allah. Allah will say be and it is and the man will be resurrected completely. So the Prophet ﷺ talks about what happens for that man on the day of judgment. He will say, uh, Allah will ask him, what made you do such a thing? He said, my fear of you, O oh Allah. So Allah will actually forgive him because of that. Yeah? Because he had a sincere belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although his belief was maybe not 100% uh, well informed. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect someone dis despite they were eaten by sharks, they were uh, drowned in the bottom of the ocean, they were buried properly. That doesn't matter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be able to resurrect them. And what the Prophet ﷺ described will happen to them in the grave, will happen to them regardless of how they were buried or not buried. Meaning the questioning that comes from the angels, the punishment or the uh, uh, types of uh, reward and good news and blessings they will receive in the grave, that will happen no matter what. Some Muslims past and present, they try to deny the world of the grave. So they said, for example, if we dig up a dead person now, we will not see what's being described by the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ said, when you are buried, for example, the grave will squeeze you. It will squeeze you in such a way, may Allah protect us, that the ribs will interlock. And that will happen to every single human being that dies. Yeah? Even one of the great Sahaba, who when he died, the throne of Allah shook. And 70,000 angels followed in his funeral procession. The Prophet ﷺ said if anyone was saved from the crushing of the grave, it would have been him. But even him, he will be squeezed. So the person might say, but if I dig the grave and watch, I will not see that occur. How it occurs, that's up to Allah. But do we believe that it occurs? Undoubtedly we believe it. Because Allah and the Prophet ﷺ informed us about that. So we know that the rules of this life don't apply in the hereafter. 
For example, the Prophet ﷺ says when talking about the weighing, he says a big fat man will come. And he will be weighed in the scale of Allah, he will weigh nothing. He will be weightless. And the weight means value. The heavier it is, the good, the better it is. So the man will be put, he will weigh nothing. While at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ says one of the Sahaba, when he climbed a palm tree or he climbed a, a tree, and he lifted up his, his sarong, yeah? So his legs were showing and his legs were so skinny. So when he was in the tree, the wind blew and the tree shook. So the Sahaba, they, they snickered, they laughed. Because it's kind of funny looking sight that the man, he's so lightweight and he's so skinny and he's shaking around with the tree. So the Prophet ﷺ said, you laugh because of how skinny his shins are, his, uh, his uh, uh, lower legs. You think that that's something funny? I swear by Allah, they will be heavier in the scales of Allah than the mountains of Uhud. And the mountains of Uhud, you can see if you go to Medina, yeah, in your uh, Umrah visit usually, you will see that. Something huge. They will be that weight in Allah's scale on the Day of Judgment. Just His shins. And He is a small and skinny person. So the, the laws of gravity, the, the laws of this world, they don't apply in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect someone who could see perfect in this life, he will bring them blind on the day of judgment. The person will say, oh Allah, why did you resurrect me blind? I could see in the previous life. So meaning I was expecting I'll be brought back in the same way at least. Allah will say, but my signs came to you and you turned a blind eye. You just pretended like you didn't see anything and you didn't know what was going on and you rejected the truth. You forgot about what Allah was sending to you. So Allah also forgot about you. So the person will be resurrected incomplete. So there are so many things like this that the Prophet ﷺ informs us about. And it's not difficult for Allah to do. And it's not difficult for us to accept. <clears throat> so when we talk about punishment of the grave and pleasures, there are so many ahadith related from the Prophet ﷺ regarding the questions of the two angels in the grave. What are the three questions that we will be asked in the grave? Who is your Lord? Huh? This is something we covered in this series before. Who is your Lord and? Who is the man that was sent to you? Or what do you say about this man? Talking about Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and? What is your? Your religion, your deen, your way of life that you are following. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the punishment of the grave, its pleasures that... Uh, uh, and it's pleasures that these are positively established realities. So the scholars, they would put this uh, as a sub point in the books of Aqidah, in the books of Creed, meaning to be a true Muslim and from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, then automatically you believe in the world of the grave, the punishment of the grave, the reward of the grave, as mentioned by Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu So some misguided sects from those who claim to be Muslim, they just canceled this entire out area out completely. So they said, oh, most of it is in the hadith. We don't accept hadith, for example. But it is mentioned in the Quran as well, as we will show now. Uh, therefore, believing in them is obligatory. One is punished in the grave if he deserves punishment. And one is given bliss if that is what he deserves. Whichever the case, one will be recompensed in the grave, regardless of whether he is buried or not, or whether he is eaten up in his grave, or whether he is cremated, or whether he is drowned. Uh, and, in the, and, and is at the bottom of the sea and so on. The proofs that establish recompense in the grave are many. Uh, number one, Allah says in the Quran, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَيُضِلُّ اللَّهُ الظَّالِمِينَ وَيَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ Allah says, Allah will keep firm those who believe with the word that stands firm in this world. Meaning, they will keep on worshipping Allah alone and none else. So they will be committed and they will uh, uh, stand uh, firm regardless of what the consequences of them worshipping Allah and following the truth might be in this world. And then Allah says, and in the hereafter. Now the Prophet ﷺ, he recited this verse in relation to that kind of questioning in the grave that we just talked about. Yeah. So this is a, a, an interpretation of that verse. Meaning, when the angels come and interrogate the person on the day of judgment, or in the, uh, in the world of the grave after they die, some, they will have known the information, but they won't be able to answer confidently. 
So the Prophet ﷺ says when the angels come, they are hulking and they are terrifying and their way is aggressive. So they will grab the person and sit the person up and they will ask the person in a very attacking way, who is your Lord and so on and so forth. There will not be a, a friendly conversation. So the Prophet ﷺ mentions that the believer will firmly and confidently answer, my Lord is Allah, my religion is Islam. They will have no hesitation, no difficulty in response. Uh, they will not be terrified. But the disbeliever, the hypocrites, and the, 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 the evil ones, and so on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them a, a difficulty even if they know the information, even if they memorize the answer. So they will say, ha ha, they will begin to stutter, and they will say, la adri, I don't know, I don't know. I used to hear the people say, so I used to say with them. But they didn't actually believe, they didn't live in accordance with that belief. <coughs> Uh, number two, Allah says in the Quran, the fire, they are exposed to it morning and afternoon. And on the day when the hour will be established, it will be said to the angels, cause Fir'aun's people to enter the severest torment. So this verse scholar said is a proof for punishment in the grave. Can anyone see where is the proof? It didn't explicitly mention the word grave. Where is the proof that this shows there will be punishment in the grave and this is specifically talking about Fir'aun and his people that they're being punished now in the grave can anyone see the evidence in that Allah says the fire they are exposed to it morning and afternoon and on the day when the hour will be established it will be said to the angels cause Fir'aun's people to enter the severest torment so meaning the first half of the verse is talking about before the day of judgment. They will be exposed to the hellfire twice a day. Once in the morning, once in the evening. So the Prophet ﷺ talked about how a person who has been evil, their grave will be opened and exposed to the hellfire. And they will actually suffer as a result thereof. Yeah? And uh, the Prophet ﷺ gave more descriptions about punishment that goes on. Angels that will come and punish the person and so on and so forth. Yeah, so beyond the hadith, even in the verse, talking about Fir'aun and his people, that this punishment will be ongoing for them from the time they died until the day of judgment is established. On the day of judgment, then the angels will be told to drive them into the hellfire, where that punishment will become even worse. May Allah protect us. This uh, verse proves that some people are punished in their graves. Uh, Imam Bukhari recorded that Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with them, said the Prophet ﷺ passed by two graves and said indeed they are being punished. So the Prophet ﷺ was given some uh, exposure to what is going on in the grave even though uh, normal people as they are passing by, they are not aware of that. The Prophet ﷺ said the punishment that goes on the in the grave, for example, he mentions an angel will come this angel will be deaf, dumb, and blind. He cannot see, he cannot hear, he cannot speak. He will come with a sledgehammer. The Prophet ﷺ said that sledgehammer would turn a mountain to dust. If you were to hit a mountain with it, it would crumble, it would crush it. So that person will come to the disbelievers and the hypocrites and so on in the grave after they have been interrogated and they are unable to answer the questions and he will smash the person. He will hit the person with the sledgehammer. The person will scream a scream, the Prophet ﷺ said, that all creation on earth can hear. The animals and so on and so forth. You will see when you go to a, a graveyard or a cemetery, you will not see animals there wandering around and living there now. So the Prophet ﷺ said, if you were able to hear what goes on in the grave, you would no longer bury your dead. So Allah, as a mercy, He doesn't expose that what's going on. And also as a test for us, because the person has to believe what Allah and the Prophet ﷺ have informed and act accordingly. Meaning, stay away from that which Allah has forbidden because they are worried of that kind of punishment. May Allah protect us. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ, he was passing by, he said, indeed, they are being punished and they are not being punished for something that is great. Then he said, indeed, for something that is great. As for one of them, he would spread tales in order to sow dissension among people. He was doing namima. Namima is where you go to people and you say, do you know what he said about you? Do you know what they said about you? Causing discord and hatred and animosity. 
And then he said, and as for the other, he would not properly protect himself from his urine. Meaning even in the way that they are using the toilet and so on, they are not uh, clean and they are not ensuring that their clothes and body remain clean, which is an essential component for your prayer to be accepted and so on. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ then took a stick or he took some kind of like a palm frond and uh, he broke it in two and he drove each of them into the grave after which he ﷺ said perhaps their punishment will be lightened as long as they do not get dry. So meaning for the period that those palm, palm fronds or, or uh, vegetation was there before it dries up that would cause some reduction in their punishment. So what scholars have mentioned is that something specific for the Prophet Wasallam, not something that we also can do and it will have the same uh, result. Uh, so these are, these are some of the uh, uh, comments about the punishment of the grave and its pleasures. Any questions or comment about that? We didn't go in much detail. There's a very detailed description in the ahadith of what happens to the soul from the moment it dies or the moment it's about to die until uh, you know it's actually uh, the day of judgment. The Prophet ﷺ gave his very detailed description, but we will not go through all of that uh, in this session. Any question? Any comment? Okay. Uh, is this information we all know? Anybody learned something new in what we said now? Can I see by a show of hands how many people said they learned something new? Sama, huh? okay. Uh, next year, they talk about the hour and its signs. When we talk about hour, the day of judgment is referred to as the hour. It doesn't mean 60 minutes. An hour in the Arabic language means a portion of time. And that could be 60 minutes, could be less, could be more. The reason scholars said it's referred to as the hour is number one, because it's something which is very close. So anything that's definitely going to happen, something that's inevitable, then it's close. And you should be preparing for it like it could happen in a minute or in an hour. Yeah? So the person who's wise and intelligent, they live their life as if the day of judgment could happen at any moment. Yeah? So you can hear from the Sahaba's words, they say, if a person goes to sleep at night, they should not go to sleep except expecting that they might not wake up in the morning. And if the person wakes up in the morning, they're going to live their day. They should not live their day except that they expect that they may not make it to the night. Meaning they're taking advantage of every moment because they don't know how much uh, time they have left. And everyone's judgment begins from the moment they die. The other reason it's referred to as the hour, scholars said, is because when it comes, when it happens, it happens instantaneous, immediate. So the Prophet ﷺ, for example, when he described Israfil, he said the angel who will blow the trumpet for the beginning of the Day of Judgment, the Prophet ﷺ said he's already inhaled and he's tilted his forehead and the trumpet is at his mouth and he's just waiting for Allah's command. That's why Allah said when the command comes, it's like the blink of an eye or even faster. So once Allah commands, he will blow the trumpet immediately. So the Prophet ﷺ said his eyes are wide open and they are like shining bright stars. He doesn't blink. He's just waiting for Allah to send him the command. Immediately he will blow the trumpet for the day of judgment to begin. Allah the Almighty says, وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُو and with him are the keys of the ghayb, of all that is hidden and unseen. None knows them but he. So Allah is the one who has knowledge of the unseen. Only he really knows when the hour will be established. So Allah, for example, says, Verily Allah with him alone is the knowledge of the hour. So even Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, when asked by the angel Gabriel, When is the hour? He said, The one who is being questioned doesn't know more than the questioner. Meaning me and you, we both don't know. And they are the greatest messenger and the greatest angel. Yeah, Both of them close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with knowledge from the unseen that he has given them. But this they also are unaware. But are there signs of the day of judgment? There are signs. There are three types of signs. There are those signs which have already happened and they happened quite some time back. For example, the sending of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. He said, me and the hour, we were sent like these two. And he put his index and middle finger together. 
Yeah? So meaning, once he's been sent, the day of judgment is getting very close. Get very close in the, in the scheme of existence and creation and time and so on. Yeah? Uh, even when the Prophet ﷺ mentions uh, Allah talking about Prophet Dawood, David, he said he was sent towards the end of times. So you can imagine, meaning there is not much time left in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes. Yeah? Uh, things like the splitting of the moon that the Prophet ﷺ did in his time. This is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment, for example. Yeah? There are also those kind of signs which are still, uh, which have started and are still ongoing that the Prophet ﷺ gave description of, many of the minor signs, and there are tens of them that he has given us some descriptions about. And this is from the proofs that he's a Prophet of Allah, because things that he predicted and spoke about have been occurring, will occur, and so on. There are then also the major signs which mean the hour is just upon us and is about to be established. And those are things like the coming of Isa, of Jesus, peace be upon him, the false Messiah, Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, you know, the Masih al Dajjal, and so on and so forth. The smoke, the Dabba, the creature. So that can be a whole series of lectures by itself. But these are from the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us. There are many verses of the Quran and sayings of Prophet Sallallahu that prove the coming of the hour. Among them are the following. Allah the Almighty says, Verily the hour is surely coming. Therein is no doubt, yet most men believe not. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, The time in which I have been sent and the hour are like these two. And he then joined his index finger and his middle one. Okay, so once the day of judgment is established, Allah describes in the Quran what will happen. The chaos that will happen in the universe from the sky tearing apart, from the mountains exploding, from the uh, uh, oceans igniting in flames. So many things in this universe will, will uh, go into chaos and people will be extremely uh, uh, terrified. Everything that's on earth will die, yeah, except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might decree will not die and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then resurrect every living creature that has ever lived. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will literally resurrect all human beings and jinn and animals and so on that have ever lived. So this is something uh, 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 unfathomable for us. It's not only the 7 million peop billion people on earth today, it's all that have ever lived from Adam alayhi salam's time. Yeah. So these billions and billions of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather them all together. So the next point we mention here is the resurrection, which we just uh, said a little bit about. The resurrection means bringing life to the dead at the second blowing of the trumpet. So the first blowing leads to that destruction and death. And the second blowing would be the resurrection of everyone. Uh, a time when people will stand barefoot, naked and uncircumcised. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He resurrects us, you will not come back to this world with anything you previously owned. You will not be able to bring your, your wealth, your home, your car, your titles. You will not even have clothing uh, when you are first resurrected. Later on, people will be clothed as the Prophet ﷺ informed us. And one of the first to be clothed, for example, will be himself and Prophet Ibrahim ﷺ. So at that moment when people are coming out like that, Aisha radiallahu anha, thinking in an innocent way, she said, but wouldn't men and women be together? They would see each other naked and so on. And this is something which we are not okay with in this life due to modesty and shyness. So the Prophet sallallahu said, the, the affair is greater than that. Meaning nobody will be thinking about such things on the day of resurrection. Everybody will be terrified and will be concerned. When people are resurrected, they will begin to discuss things like how long has it been? How long did we live in that world? How long have we been in the grave? People will feel like it was only a day or part of a day. Yeah? So they will look back to this life which we hold so dearly to now and they will feel like it was something insignificant. So the person who is living in this world should remember it's just moments. Look back at your life, the 30, 40, 50, 60 years you've already lived, what is it? It's snapshots. You cannot even re-experience every second. You cannot even remember if Allah says, name every good thing you've ever done and I will reward you for it. You won't even be able to remember all the good deeds you've done. And if Allah says, I will forgive you for all the sins you've ever done, mention them all now, you won't even be able to remember all the sins that you've committed. 
but it's just fleeting moments that sometimes uh, uh, we overvalue and we give too much time and effort for those fleeting pleasures in this life when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds ma indakum yamfad wa ma indallahi baq what you have will vanish will perish but what is with Allah will remain forever so the Prophet ﷺ once he had slaughtered an animal and he told his family to distribute the meat. And they distributed all of it except for the shoulder part where the Prophet ﷺ used to like to eat. So when they left that piece for him, the Prophet ﷺ said, what, what is remaining? So they said the shoulder part is remaining. He said, no, all of it's remaining except for the shoulder part. Meaning all that you donated for the sake of Allah, that will remain forever. That we will get the reward for in the hereafter. But whatever you just enjoy for a few moments in this life is something, ter uh, is something uh, uh, temporary that will pass by and is fleeting. <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty says, as we begin the first creation, we shall repeat it. It is a promise binding upon us. Truly, we shall do it. The Prophet Sallallahu in one narration says, everything from the son of Adam will disintegrate and turn to dust completely, except for the coccyx, which is the last vertebrae in the spinal cord. Yeah, the tailbone at the very end of your body. That part is extremely solid. Yeah, and will last versus the other bones that the person has. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, you will grow from your grave like a plant does. Allah will send down a kind of rain that the Prophet ﷺ said will be white and people will literally grow out from their grave as Allah had created them the first time barefoot, naked and uncircumcised. Yeah? <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we mentioned uh, mentions that recreating people is not difficult for him when he created them in the first place. Allah says when talking about the truth of the resurrections uh, uh, after that surely you will die then again, surely you will be resurrected on the day of resurrection. And uh, the Quran is full of reminders of how uh, we were created from the earth, we will return back to the earth, and Allah will bring us forth from the earth again. So he reminds us, for example, when you look at the savannah or the Serengeti, this kind of desert, and you see the earth is so dead, dry, cracked, there's no plants, there's no animals, there's no life, nothing. And even the animals in that area, if you watch those kind of nature documentaries, they show how they're on the verge of dying because there's no food, no plants, no nothing, no water. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down rain in abundance and it may rain in that place only once or twice a year, for example. And from that rain, the plants come out again, the animals are brought back to uh, life and refreshed and suddenly the area which was complete death is full of life and teeming with life subhanallah so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says look be reminded about how Allah after death brings life back so too he will do for you on the day of resurrection as for the sunnah the Prophet sallallahu said then Allah will send water from the sky and you will grow just like vegetables grow and the Muslims unanimously agree that it is the truth yeah so this is about the resurrection after the resurrection comes the gathering the mahshar so Allah will literally gather all the people together in one place we are reminded about this great event in the Hajj so those who didn't just uh, stay inside their tent and they went out during the Hajj in Arafah for example and you went to Jabal al-Rahmah you went to the Mount of Mercy and there you saw the people gathered and Allah if it's a, if it's a hot day in the middle of the day and you feel the sun pounding on you and you get exhausted and you had to walk kilometers from your tent just to get there then you stand there begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the people and you see everybody in tears it's reminding you of the day of resurrection because to see tens of thousands of people all together in the Hajj you have maybe three million four million who are gathered there it's an overwhelming sight so the day of judgment is that times a thousand, times a million. Yeah? Every single person who has ever existed, all there together. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the sun close and the people will be suffering. They will wait 50,000 years for judgment to begin. So much so they will suffer just from waiting for the judgment to begin. And nobody can even uh, 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 dare to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ask him to start the judgment so they will gather together all humans and they will begin discussing what can we do how can we try to influence this in some way so they will say we need to find somebody significant and important 
So they will talk to each other, they will say, let's go to Adam. He's our father, he's the first human, Allah created him. And they will remind Adam about that. They will say, Allah created you with his own hands. And he's the one who created that soul and had it blown into you. And Allah is the one who did this for you and that for you. He was honored in special ways. Go to Allah, ask him to start the judgment. Adam will refuse. He will say, nafsi, nafsi, myself, myself. Go to other than me, try Nuh. Then they will go to Nuh, they will say, you were the first messenger ever sent to mankind. And they will beg him, he will refuse. And then he will send them to Ibrahim alayhi salam, and so on. They will try going through all these important characters from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, hoping that any one of them will intercede. The only one who will do it is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And that is a great shafa'ah that he will do for all of mankind, for the uh, judgment to begin. So about the gathering, Allah will say uh, in the Qur'an, on the day when the earth shall be cleft from off them, meaning the graves will be opened, they will come out hastening forth, that will be a gathering quite easy for us. And Allah says, and you will see the earth as a leveled plain. There will be no buildings, there will be no mountains, no trees, no umbrella, nothing to hide from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever. The people will be gathered on the day of judgment and they will be barefooted, naked and uncircumcised, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. Oh, the, the, the previous verse, we didn't finish it. Allah says, And you will see the earth as a leveled plain and we shall gather them all together so as to leave not one of them behind. So everybody will move unanimously, uh, uh, simultaneously towards the land of the gathering where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge them. Then the reckoning will occur. This means that Allah will show man the deeds that he performed in this world and he will admit what he did. At that time, people will take the rights that are due to them from others and all of that is most easy for Allah. That the accountability and judgment will take place is proven by many verses from the Quran as well as a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Allah says, فَلَنَسْأَلَنَّ الَّذِينَ أُرْسِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَنَسْأَلَنَّ الْمُرْسَلِينَ Allah says, then surely we will question those people to whom it was sent, meaning the revelation, the book, and verily we shall question the messengers. Even the messengers will be questioned. Allahu Akbar. May Allah help us. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعُرِضُوا عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ صَفَّىٰ لَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَا كَمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّىٰ Allah says, and they will be set before your Lord in lines as rows, and Allah will say, now indeed you have come to us as we created you the first time. So for example, the Prophet ﷺ informed us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wiped from the shoulder over the back of Adam salam after he created him, the first human. And he extracted from his backbone every offspring that would ever live, all humans. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala held them all together in his hand. And he spoke to them directly. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he gathers us all, he says, again, now you have come to us as we created you the first time. Allah will himself take account of man's deeds. Uh, Adi bin Hatim, may Allah be pleased with him, related that the Prophet sallallahu said, there is not one from you except that Allah will speak to him. There will not be between him and him, meaning between Allah and the person, any interpreter. There will be no uh, translator, nobody who is uh, able to defend you as a lawyer, no such thing. He, the man, will look to his right and see only that which he put forth, meaning he will see all his deeds and what he's done. And he will look to his left and see only that which he put forth, he will see all of his deeds. And he will look before him and will see only the hellfire, which will reach his face. Meaning the heat of that hellfire will be reaching to his face. May Allah protect us. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, So protect yourselves from the fire, even if you do so with part of a date. A date meaning the date fruit. Even if all you have is a half of it, a part of it, the Prophet ﷺ said, Give it in charity. Give it as a savior, as a protection for you from the anger and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. May Allah protect us. The scholars have mentioned Allah will literally judge people simultaneously once the judgment begins. How will he do that? Only Allah knows. And that is not difficult for Allah. 
Uh, next, they mentioned the Hawd, the basin, the huge basin or, or pool or pond or lake that the Prophet ﷺ has been given and every Prophet or, or nation will have one. Uh, uh, for the Prophet ﷺ, it will be one that is uh, immense and huge. Uh, so everyone who is a follower from the nation of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ will be allowed to drink from it. And this is significant because on the Day of Judgment, as people are waiting, they are just dying from thirst. And they will sweat in such a way, the Prophet ﷺ said, the sweat will be commensurate to your uh, uh, righteousness. So some people will be in the sweat up to their ankles. Some people will be up to their knees, up to their waist. Some people will be up to their neck. Some people will be drowning in their own sweat, gasping for air. Yeah? because of how long they are standing and the sun beating down on them. Some people will be reclining on couches under the shade of Allah's throne. May Allah make us from them. Yeah? So some people, they will not suffer like others on that day. We ask Allah and we beg Him that we be from those people. So the Prophet ﷺ will talk about how people also, they will be so thirsty on that day. And if they drink from this kind of a pool, then that means that they will not feel thirst uh, again after that the prophet sallallahu uh, was among his companions he said i am at the hold waiting for whoever from you comes to me to drink so on the day of judgment he will be there first before any of his followers can reach to that pond or that pool to drink the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says by allah some men will be blocked from coming to me so the angels will be there they will push some people back. They will not allow them as they are coming forth and they are claiming that they are from the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu says, and I will say, my Lord, they are from me and from my nation. Those are my followers. Those are my people. Why are they not being allowed to reach to my pond? It will be said, indeed, you do not know what they did after you. They continued to go back on their heels. Yeah? This is recorded by Bukhari. This hadith establishes the reality of the Hawd and that people who innovate in religion or people who go against the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ will be prevented from drinking it. So your name is Muhammad, your name is Abdullah, your name is Khadija, your name is Fatima, your IC says Muslim, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that on the Day of Judgment that you will just be allowed to pass through without any difficulties. It will be in accordance with how you actually lived, what you believed, and how you acted based upon those beliefs. The hadiths regarding the Hawd are so many that its existence is positively established. Abdul Malik ibn, uh, bin Umair said, I heard Jundub, may Allah be pleased with him, say, I heard the Prophet wasallam say, I am your predecessor at the Hawd, yeah? recorded by Imam Bukhari. So these are authentic hadith that establish there is a Hawd. The Prophet ﷺ will be there. May Allah bless us to see him and be with him and to be able to drink from it. Uh, next, they talk about the scale or the balance. So the scale is an apparatus for weighing things. The scale of the hereafter is real. It has two real pans. It has two sides. One that will weigh good deeds. One that will weigh bad deeds. Upon it, the deeds of Allah's worshippers will be placed. The scale exhibits Allah's justice, for He doesn't wrong any soul. So this scale is uh, not one that's biased. In this world, they said they put Lady Liberty and she's wearing a blindfold and she's holding the scale. And that same court, you can bribe and you can use your connections to get out of anything. Yeah? And there's no real justice. So in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's court and his scale cannot be influenced by anybody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and if it's even the weight of a mustard seed, a dharra, and a dharra means a tiny seed or a tiny ant, the smallest type of ant. Yeah? And some even took it further and said it's talking about molecules or atoms. So the smallest imaginable measurable size of anything, Allah says, it will be weighed on the scale. 
good or bad. You did even microscopic, microscopic amount of good, Allah will include it in your good deeds on the scale. You did even a tiny bit of harm or evil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also bring it and all of it will be weighed and the person will be held accountable accordingly. So Allah will bring forth the deeds of men, including deeds that are, that are in weight, that in weight are equal to a grain or a mustard seed. Those deeds will be weighed. One will be rewarded according to the results of the weighing. The scale of deeds may be one or many, and Allah is capable over all things. Here are two of the proofs that establish the reality of the scale. Allah says, وَتَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِسْطَ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا Allah says, and we shall set up balances of justice on the day of resurrection, then none shall be dealt with unjustly in anything. And if there be the weight of a mustard seed, we will bring it, and sufficient are we as reckoners. So as we mentioned, you might not even remember good things that you did, Allah will weigh it and reward you for it. You might not even remember sins that you've committed, but Allah says, أَحْصَاهُ اللَّهُ فَنَسُوهُ Allah recorded it even though they forgot about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not miss even the slightest amount. Now, that day though, as we mentioned, the scale will not be a typical scale. So a person that was huge and strong and large, he will weigh nothing in the eyes of Allah, while someone who was skinny and small, he will be so heavy in Allah's scale. And the Prophet ﷺ talks about a man who has pages and pages and scrolls of sins. So when they're brought forth and they're massive in quantity and they're put on his uh, side of sins he's terrified and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings forth from his good side a card just one tiny thing and it's minuscule in size compared to those so the man says and what can this do in relation to all of that that I have he just feels hopeless and doomed so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put that card on his side of good deeds and it'll make his pages of sins fly because of how heavy it is compared and that card is la ilaha illallah testifying sincerely and truly that there is no god worthy of worship except allah not associating any partner with him this is the greatest good deed that anyone can do if they truly live in accordance with it there are conditions to la ilaha illallah of course as we already mentioned in this series for it to be valid uh, and of benefit to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who truly benefit from it. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ says when talking about the scale, he says two words, beloved to the most merciful, light on the tongue and heavy on the scale, meaning on the day of judgment the reward will be so great. What are those uh, phrases? Does anybody know? I'm hearing something, but Subhanallah wa bihamdihi and Subhanallah al azim Yeah. So uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said, "How perfect Allah is, and with His praise, and how perfect Allah is the Magnificent." So these are two very simple tasbih. They don't cause you money. They don't cause you much time. They don't cause you much effort. You can say it as you're sitting in the car driving somewhere. You can say it as you're laying down in your bed right before you sleep. It doesn't take anything. But the Prophet ﷺ says Allah will give you so much credit for them in your scale on the Day of Judgment. So the person should be eager and putting a lot of effort to make their scale heavy with good deeds. May Allah forgive us. The previous proofs establish the weighing of deeds on the scale, the success that results from good deeds being heavy, and the loss that results from the good deeds being light. I think we'll end there. Uh, next time we can continue talking about the sirat, the path that the Prophet ﷺ said, the bridge that everyone will have to cross over hellfire, the shafa'ah, the intercessions, and the different types of intercessions that will occur on the Day of Judgment, then Paradise and Hellfire. Are there any questions, any comments? <clears throat> There's a button from the bottom. From the bottom, you have to push it in. 
Bismillah. Um, earlier you recited the ayah. Um, Walladina walad inna alladina amanu walladina hadu wa nasara wa wasabiin. Yeah. So um, I think this ayah was uh, misquoted oftentimes by um, non-Muslims or even Muslims ourselves. So how how do we how do we actually respond to this ayat and the react, um, the saying of people that um, not only Islam is the way mm. to to heaven to, to Jannah. Yeah. So how do we actually respond in short? I mean, there there are so many other verses and so many other ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ that explain it. So you can never take verse in isolation. This is a catastrophe, and this is how all the misguided sects that attribute themselves to Islam were created and are still existing until today. It's by taking a few certain verses or a few certain ahadith and then interpreting them and you know, translating them in any way that we like, in the way that suits and fits our particular agenda. So this is not the way to approach Islam. This is not the way to approach any topic in Islam. To uh, address any topic in Islam, we have to look at all the verses related to the topic. So how do we do tafsir, for example? We do tafsir by using verses of the Qur'an to explain other verses of the Qur'an. And this is uh, uh, evident in so many different cases and so many different topics. One verse gives you further information about the topic that another verse mentioned or talked about. So they have to be taken all together. They cannot just be taken individually. You say, okay, look, I, I look at this verse by itself. The verse wasn't revealed in isolation just like that. There's a whole surah that it's a part of. There's a whole book that it's a part of. All of it is taken together. The Quran was not written the way people will write their books. When people write a book, what do they do? They say, chapter one. And in chapter one, I mention everything about this topic. Chapter two, I talk about everything about this topic. Quran is not like that. Quran is a living reminder. It's the words of Allah. So that means as you read it, every surah that you read, you are getting reminded and inspired and it's bringing you closer to Allah. So you find the same topic mentioned throughout. For example, when we talk about Day of Judgment, Day of Judgment is almost mentioned in every single surah, constantly being reminded about it. Why? Why didn't Allah just make one surah about Day of Judgment finished? No, that's not the point. That's not the point. But if you then want to take an Islamic ruling or you want to come to a conclusion about a specific topic, then you need to look at all the verses related to that topic together, even if they're in different places in the Quran. Yeah? So Allah and the Prophet ﷺ have already made it very clear to us that there is a right way and a wrong way, for example, to believe in Allah in the last day. So in this verse, Allah said, those who believe in Allah in the last day. So those who say Jesus is Allah, they are not believing in Allah in the right way, for example. Yeah? So there's a right way and a wrong way to believe in Allah. There's a right way and a wrong way then to o obey and worship Allah. So those who were the true followers of Jesus, for example, or the true followers of Moses, when they are here today, they no longer can remain as true followers of Jesus or Moses. That's why the Prophet ﷺ explicitly said, as an example, Anyone from the people of the book who hears about me and doesn't believe in me, meaning doesn't start to follow me as the messenger of Allah, will be in hellfire, for example. So why? Because now when the last and final messenger has been sent, he has to be followed. So when Jesus was sent to the Israelites, no longer can they say, no, 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 we don't follow you, we just follow Moses, Musa a.s. That's not acceptable. They then automatically have to follow uh, Isa alayhi salam and he came to reaffirm what was in the Torah Prophet Muhammad sallallahu reaffirms what was in the Torah and in the Injil from the truth that Allah wants mankind to follow during this time period yeah so the 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 evidence is so clear and uh, 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 there's no room for any more doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said inna deen عند Allah Al-Islam, the religion that Allah will accept and, and uh, consider valid is true submission to Him. What is Islam? Islam is the truth that every prophet and messenger came with. So any of their true followers at their time, they were Muslims, they were submitters, they will be in paradise and they will be from those who are successful in the hereafter. 
So in this day and age, that will be only those who believe in and follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? Any other questions or comments? Yes, sister. The microphone, there's one there for the ladies. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Um, I have two questions. Um, number one, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. okay. It's um, faint, but I can hear. Yeah. It's on. Um, you know, people ask when somebody dies, they would say something like, oh, dia dah pergi menghadap Allah. Or he has gone to meet the maker. Okay. But then, I, in, I think it's not accurate from mm. what I read because I don't think after we die, we're going to meet Allah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it doesn't sound like a, a valid expression. We do say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We do say to Allah, we belong and to Him we return. But that doesn't mean literally that you will go immediately in the world of the grave and meet Him, meaning see Him or speak to Him directly or anything like that. No. That doesn't happen in the world of the grave. When would we get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise? So nobody has seen Allah in this world, including Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we will get to see him in the hereafter, those who believe and those who are righteous and so on. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talked about how the soul, once it dies, will meet with other souls in the world of the souls. Yeah. So in this world of the Barzakh, the soul will literally meet others who have already died and say, where is so-and-so? They will ask about a particular person who already died. Why is he not here to be recorded in Iliyin amongst the righteous and so on? They will say, he didn't make it with us. And they will be sad. They will be disappointed. Like he wasn't from us actually, unfortunately. Yeah? So there is some kind of like... Uh, recognition going on in the world of the uh, barzakh but it doesn't explicitly mention anywhere that you would uh, speak to Allah or meet Allah the Prophet Sallallahu says uh, Allah loves those who meet who, 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 who love to meet him so Aisha Radana got worried about that she said but we're, we're uh, afraid of death we don't want to die look forward to death for example there's a kind of nervousness that humans have about dying so the Prophet ﷺ said, no, that's not what's intended. It's once you die, then immediately you are getting glad tidings or you are getting warnings and punishment and so on. So as a result, the person is either very eager and longing to meet Allah because they know that it's going to be all good for them. Allah has forgiven them. They have reward waiting or the opposite. So they are quite terrified and they dislike meeting Allah and Allah also hates to meet them. Yeah. So that meeting then would occur, as we mentioned, when Allah is holding the person accountable for their deeds, and they would get to see Allah if they are from the believers in paradise, and so on. Allah knows best. There was another question you said too? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I read also that there is this man, last, I don't know, sure, I'm not sure whether he was a sabah, but he did mention that when he dies, after he's been buried, um, stay with him for the, 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 the length of a camel being slaughtered so that he'll be ready for the questioning. Uh, he was buried with a, with a what of a camel? No, no. When, he was bar when he's buried, he, would, he, would, he told his friends or something yeah. that he said when he dies and when he's been buried, yeah. stay with him at the grave for okay. as long as a camel being slaughtered. Oh, okay. And then uh, so that he'll be ready for questioning. Okay. So the question is, would it be um, relevant at present time that if we write it in our will that we tell our relative to stay okay. at the grave so that we'll be ready? Okay, I'm, I'm not familiar with the authenticity of that narration that says, for example, uh, if I die, stay there for as long as it takes to slaughter a camel. I'm not sure about that. But I do know that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was uh, in a uh, funeral, uh, procession and they buried the dead he then said make dua for your brother because he's being questioned now yeah so the questioning will occur so meaning make dua for him that Allah will give him steadfastness for example so that he will uh, uh, you know be able to answer the questions firmly that Allah will have mercy on him forgive him and so on so making dua is something valid you are not praying to the dead you are praying for the dead obviously yeah 
and this is something that the Prophet Sallallahu did. But that you should uh, sit there for a certain amount of time, I, I never heard such a thing, or that you should read Yasin or do certain kind of uh, surahs or all this stuff, I never came across any of that authentically narrated about the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba. Yeah? Uh, and of course, you can and should make dua for the dead even after you leave the cemetery, even a long time after they're dead, especially for people like your parents and others. And inshallah, they might benefit from that uh, if Allah accepts. So the person should not just feel like it's only at that moment. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ does say that the person will go through the journey through the skies to the Iliyin if they are a, a sincere believer, for example, and their soul will come all the way back to the grave for the questioning that will occur and all that occurs before the friends have finished uh, burying in the grave and they walk away. So the Prophet ﷺ said the person will be given the ability to hear and they will hear the footsteps of their friends or the family that were at the grave site walking away. Yeah? So this will give them the, uh, the sense that they then are alone. Yeah? So the Prophet ﷺ said things go with you to your grave but nothing stays there with you. So your friends, family, if you ask them, get in the grave with me, you love me so much, be with me, nobody will do it. Nobody will do it. Yeah? So we also should not be willing to sacrifice our akhirah under the name of I'm doing it for family. So you find the person doesn't pray. Why you don't pray? I'm busy making money. Why are you so busy making money? For my family, I love them. Okay, then ask your money and your family to get in your grave with you and see if they will stay. To help you in the hereafter, to question, to answer Allah why you didn't pray, why you didn't do what you were commanded to do. For example, the person will, will find themselves shortchanged. Yeah? So you don't sacrifice your akhirah uh, 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 for the dunya. You rather are willing to sacrifice your dunya for the sake of akhirah. Yeah? Allah knows best. Okay, any other questions or comments? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. There are some Muslims who say it's, it's okay to, for example, uh, wish Christians uh, during the Christmas, uh, Christmas and join the time. celebrations and wish Hindus happy Diwali and joining their celebrations. Yeah. Uh, would this have any effect on the la ilaha illallah on the card, on the scale on that, on that day? The, 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 the problem becomes behind uh, you know, these kind of greetings and so on. What is your belief and intention? So if the person, for example, believes what they are doing is valid, like the brother asked, if somebody says Christianity is valid, you will go to paradise as a Christian. The scholar said the Muslim that believes that is no longer a Muslim. That's one of the nullifiers. We covered it in this series already. That's one of the nullifiers of faith. So if you are uh, even doubtful about the fact that Islam is the truth, Islam is the right way, that other ways are not correct, you actually cannot be considered a Muslim anymore. Because you are basically saying it's all the same, just follow anyway, even though these ways are contradictory, especially in the fundamental things like concept of God. Are there similarities between Islam and, for example, Christianity and Judaism? Definitely. Why? Because they came originally from the same source. But over time, the other ones have been corrupted and manipulated. So no longer is it valid to follow that way. So a celebration like Christmas, where they are saying, this is the day God the Son, or the Son of God was born. This is a catastrophe. Allah says, He is about to tear the sky apart, and he's about to crush the mountains and split the earth. Uh, because they falsely claim that the most merciful has a child, has a son. So for Allah, this is a crime. This is something wrong. He doesn't like it. He doesn't accept it. You as a human wouldn't accept someone falsely attributing a child to you. Oh, this child. Oh, look, you have another child from an illegitimate relationship. And you will say, well, you're... you're you are attacking my honor, you are attacking my dignity, this is not my child, this is a lie, you will be outraged. So they are doing this now about Allah, not about a human, not about one of the creations of Allah. So Allah doesn't accept that. And, and this form of uh, shirk, this form of associating partners with Allah is unforgivable in Allah's eyes if a person dies committing it. So Allah says any crime, any sin, He can forgive in the hereafter if He wants. 
from those who truly believe in him. The only one he will never forgive is associating a partner with him, worshipping or believing in someone other than him. Yeah? So this crime then, we make a day to celebrate it, for example. You as a Muslim cannot be happy with that or okay with that or participate in that or congratulate the people who are doing that. I mean, it, it fundamentally doesn't fit. That doesn't mean you attack the people on the day that they are celebrating. No, we are not saying that. But at the same time, you cannot go and tell them, I'm so happy for you, congratulations, it's wonderful what you are doing and saying. If people made a day to celebrate uh, falsely attributing a child to your father, you love your father, they are insulting your father, they are going against his uh, wishes and his honor, you will not come to them on the day when they are doing that and say, great, good congratulations for you as you insult my father. Here I want to give you a gift also. Or you're having a party, I will come to the party. It's wonderful and I will enjoy with you as you insult my father. People will look at you and say, what's wrong with you? You have no dignity or what? Why would you do such a thing? So a Muslim has religious dignity. Religious dignity automatically means you don't participate in something that you belief fundamentally goes against your beliefs now that doesn't mean when we live in a multi-religion society like this you attack the people that are doing that and you have to fight with them nobody's saying this but the idea is you don't need to participate in it willingly and say that you are okay with it it can open a chance for some dialogue oh did you know that jesus was not born on december 25th for example he was born in the summer not in the winter <laughs> yeah and you can talk about all kinds of things because the celebration itself, even by their religious standard, it's not valid. Jesus was born when the dates were ripe. That's the summertime, not in the winter. The December 25th day was a day that was significant to the pagan Romans and Emperor Constantine. He, he, he inserted it into Christianity to make it easier for his people to become Christian at that time. That was around 325 A.D. Yeah, so before that there was no Christmas, there was no, that was a few hundred years after Jesus' time. Yeah? And then the way they celebrate Christmas, for example, you find one verse in the Bible talking about the Christmas celebration. It says, don't cut down trees, don't ornament and decorate the trees with gold and silver, and then nail them up in your house which is the Christmas tree that they use today for celebrating Christmas. Jesus says in the Bible, don't do that. And that's what they do. And they say we are celebrating his birthday. But that's insulting to him. He said, don't do that. So this is like uh, what we call a bid'ah in Islam. Yeah? It's an innovation that they just made up. So the problem is we then come to them and we are like reassuring them on the thing that we believe they are doing, which is wrong. We should be telling them, well, technically what you're doing is not the right way. If you really want to love and honor and respect Jesus, let's come and see what was his life about. What was his true message? The Bible is full of Jesus saying that the Lord is only one Lord. Yeah, Deuteronomy 4, for example, in the Bible, it's one of the clear mitzvahs and uh, uh, commandments that the Lord is only one. Don't associate partners with him. And then they made a day to celebrate that he is a part of a trinity and he is the God, the Son, or the Son of God. It's problematic. So the Muslims should do their best. Now, uh, you say, well, my family is not Muslim, my neighbors are not Muslim, my co-workers are not Muslim, what do I do about it? Well, I mean, you don't have to open this kind of debate with them. We are not saying necessarily. If you find the opportunity, do it. If not, then you can be a little bit more diplomatic and tactful about it. So they may invite you. You just apologize for any reason that you cannot come to the party or celebration where they are celebrating this thing that you don't agree with. Especially if it's something like go to the church and they're going to do the prayers and all that. You shouldn't participate in that as a Muslim. Yeah? Now they give you some greetings. You can give a generic greeting back. So for example, there's public holiday at that time. Oh, have a nice uh, public holiday. Have a nice vacation. Have a nice whatever. That's it. You wish them well as a human being and you also pray for them that Allah will guide them and so on. So you don't have to confront them and say, Jesus is not the son of God. You're going to hell. And we're not saying also that you do something like that. Yeah. So hopefully you can understand the issue in a balanced way. Okay. Any other, uh, did I answer the question or I went on a, I went on a tirade, huh? One of my rants. I lose control sometimes. It can if the person, for example, believes what they are claiming is valid. 
If you believe, for example, that Jesus is the Son of God, your La ilaha illallah is canceled 100%. Yeah? But uh, just giving the greeting, some scholars are very strict about it. Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim and others, rahimahumullah, they said this is completely unacceptable because of what it uh, stands for and even any kind of celebration which is not founded in Islam is unacceptable to participate in. So they went very broad. They said, for example, even a kind of national public holidays, all these ones are invalid. For them, they said the only holidays are the Eids because the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah replaced your celebrations. When he found people in Medina, they had different days they would celebrate. He said, Allah replaced all these celebrations for your, your previous way of life, invalid. The only two are Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. And the third one would be the Jum'ah is a Eid for us as well. Yeah? So anything beyond that, some scholars said, completely invalid. You shouldn't celebrate them. You shouldn't congratulate people about them or, or participate in it because you are like validating what they are doing and so on. Other scholars said, no, there are some which uh, would be okay if it's with this intention or that intention. But it's a little bit of a slippery slope. You have to prove uh, uh, the validity of such things. So the idea is if you're doing something that is becoming a part of what we consider deen, religion, then you need an evidence to prove it's valid, not the other way around. Meaning I don't need evidence to prove it's invalid. It's already invalid unless I can say, no, this is halal and this is the evidence that it's halal. Yeah? Because these kind of celebrations are considered from the, the matters of religion, yeah? according to most scholars. Allah knows best. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise, we'll end there. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.